Washington, D.C., in his special transport plane, comes the president of the Provisional Government of France, General Charles de Gaulle. Beginning a goodwill tour of America, he is welcomed by Secretary of State Burns. At the White House, General de Gaulle arrives to meet President Truman. In straightforward talks, the two leaders made notable progress on mutual problems, reaffirming the strong bonds of friendship between France and the United States. At Hyde Park, New York, de Gaulle visits the grave of the late President Franklin D. Roosevelt with Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt a tribute from the French people to an American war casualty. Inspecting the United States Military Academy across the Hudson at West Point, the general places a wreath at the base of a statue given to West Point by the École Polytechnique of France. Before continuing his tour, the honored French leader expresses France's thanks to the United States. General de Gaulle speaks in English. I want to thank again the American people for the magnificent effort which under the leadership of your two great presidents, Roosevelt and Truman, has made possible the victory. Without you, Americans, their world have been no future for Europe and Asia, but a terrible servitude. There would have been neither freedom nor justice for the world. Long live the United States of America. has come to bloody Okinawa, and with it the building of a new society under American occupation. Schools have been opened. The teachers are natives selected for their skill and scholastic background. Okinawa's children are being given the fundamentals of a free democratic education. is making its appearance as one basis of better understanding, and earnest efforts go into the new learning. An old piano plays a new tune. A way of life is being implanted that may help to keep war forever from the Pacific. Paris, the end of the historic trial of 89-year-old Henri-Philippe Pétain. Pierre Laval arrived, last of the parade of France's political leaders to testify. His early testimony practically ignores Pétain, craftily aimed at absolving himself when France tries him for treason. He tries to laugh it off, but the court brings him back to Vichy and the record. Vichy, where Laval broadcast one unforgettable phrase, I hope for a German victory. Now Pétain's trial is ended. The evidence is in. At 4 a.m., the aged marshal returns to court to hear the verdict and the sentence. It is a tense moment for the former hero of France and for a world that must deal with the war guilty of many nations. Pétain is found guilty, the sentence death. But because of his age, the sentence is commuted to a lifetime behind bars for prisoner Pétain, one-time marshal of France. Escorted by American fighter planes, Japan's surrender envoys arrive at Ieshima en route to Manila in white planes marked with green buses as directed by General MacArthur. Fur-helmeted Japanese pilots guide their transports onto landing strips wrested from the enemy in bitter fighting a few months ago. Now the enemy travels under terms of truce to carry out the first formalities of complete Japanese surrender. The Vice Chief of Japan's Imperial Army Staff, Lieutenant General Tarishiro Kawabe, wearing the gold braid, 
heads the delegation of 16 military, naval, and government officials. Received by American representatives, the Japanese get instructions for the next stage of their journey to General MacArthur's headquarters in Manila. There will be no misunderstanding of Allied orders. The delegates board two C-54 transports to fly to Manila. Pearl Harbor, Nanking, Hong Kong, Bataan. These and other memories of imperialism turn to ashes for the representatives of defeated Japan. The United States 5th Air Force transports land at Nichols Field outside Manila. Now the official Japanese delegates will receive orders of the Supreme Allied Commander for the surrender and occupation of Japan. General Kawabe is met by Colonel S.F. Mashbeer with cold formality. Major General Charles Willoughby, MacArthur's intelligence chief, escorts the Japanese from the field. staff cars take the delegates to their temporary quarters. That night at Manila's City Hall, they arrive to present their credentials to the Allied authorities. The Japanese are relieved of their samurai swords before entering the conference room. General MacArthur's chief of staff, Lieutenant General Richard Sutherland, acts for the Supreme Commander. General MacArthur does not meet the Japanese in person. The official surrender credentials are presented. General Sutherland leaves and the Japanese await their next orders. Later, Sutherland joins with other officers to extract full information on Japan's defenses and other details of the first landings in Japan. Japan is brought to complete capitulation. Important areas of Japan will be occupied, and the Emperor will carry out General MacArthur's orders. With surrender signed in Tokyo itself, Japan's ambitions of conquest and the horror and death they caused are brought to a final end. Oh.